to introduce Ed Welch. Ed Welch is a faculty member at CCEF and has been so for 35 years. Ed has his PhD in counseling psychology with a neuropsychology specialty from the University of Utah. He also has his Master of Divinity from Biblical Theological Seminary. Ed has been counseling for over 30 years. He's written many books and articles on biblical counseling topics such as addictions, depression, anxiety, shame, and Christian community. Ed and his wife, Sherry, have two married daughters and eight grandchildren. I am honored to call him a friend and a mentor, and I'm excited to introduce him to you. So let me pray for him as we get started, and then I'll hand it over to Ed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to have technology that brings us together and brings together a global community from all over the world. We do pray that you would be with us today, that you would teach us through Ed's uh, words, that we would be encouraged, that we would be instructed, and that we would leave uh, that we would leave having been helped and coming closer to you and to one another. Would you bless this time and speak through Ed, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. And Ed, you have the floor, my friend. Thank you very much, Wayne. It is really is a pleasure to to be with you and think about I think something very, very important for, for the next hour. My only regret is, as Wayne said, that we're not all in the same time zone. I had a nice morning of work and a good lunch and a cup of tea, and now I'm ready for my afternoon nap, and, and everybody else is all strewn out all over the, uh, the clock. So, so unfortunately, we're not all sort of cozily together. But other than that, it really is a, a privilege to, to meet with you. The, let me give you a little bit of background on this topic for myself. I, I think there are probably two ways into it for me. One is that some of you might know I wrote something on shame, and it, it, it took me into Scripture I never anticipated. And in, in one of the places it goes is to this particular theme of, of the priest. The second thing is it's just been invigorating to, 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 to put on this particular identity. My argument will be that that the theme of priest in the scripture is it, it, it's it's not one am, among many. It is, it is it is a prominent, arguably a preeminent way that we should be under, understanding ourselves. And so, as a result, you're going to find all of scripture. If we're onto it, you're going to find all of scripture is is enhancing this particular self understanding and Christ understanding. So anyway, I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you, and, and I'll pray as well, just as, as we get started, because if it really is something rich in Scripture, the Spirit will be in it and apply it to us. So let me pray. Father, I do pray that your Spirit would, as we've gathered together, that in this hour, your Spirit would give each of us something that that warms our heart toward you, and 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 you you, you stir us up in a way that we can bless others wisely and lovingly in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, there are other ways that, that we could get into this as well. For example, you know, here's, here's some questions we could, all, we could all probably agree with. Do you ever feel alone or afraid? The topic we're identifying is a topic, is the topic, the identity that captures our communion with God. And, and it, it, it enhances closeness and drawing near to the Lord. Do you you ever struggle with feeling alone or, or feeling afraid? Do you, ever, do you ever find that the Christian life is, is a bit mechanical? It's, it's obeying, it's striving, it's failing, it's trying a little bit harder, it's getting a bit discouraged and trying harder again. The, our time together will, will, will recalibrate the very center of the Christian life. And it will put our communion with Christ at that center. We won't forget about obedience, but it will serve the purpose of our relationship with Christ. Do you ever feel as though your your knowledge of Scripture seems heavenly, earth, rather than earthly, rather than relevant to day to day life? Do you, do you ever feel as though it's somehow how divorced? And and how how do we bring Heaven and earth, so they meet in a way that is that is really rich and, and joyful in daily life. Those are some of the questions that can move us into this particular topic. Here would be a, a positive way to put it. 
have you ever, have you ever had a wonderful meal with the best of friends? And it was, it was a fellowship that you just wanted to, to have linger, where people loved one another, they loved Jesus, and it was just, things were just right for the moment. If, if you've ever had an experience like that, and you would like it to persist just a bit longer, this is, this is the way that God brings us in to, to Scripture. So, great topic. Here's, here's, the, here's the core of it that, that we want to identify over, over our time together. Here's, here's who we are. Here's what God is up to in Scripture. We are created for fellowship and communion with God. We're created to, to live in his house to receive his hospitality, and somehow to participate in his splendor, in his very being and the glory of his kingdom. That, that summary of scripture is captured best by, that we are, by how we are these royal priests unto the Lord. That's, that's what we want to be after. The, the way we're going to do it is, and this is going to be recognizable to you, we're going to we're going to trace the storyline through Scripture. If this really is a preeminent feature of, of, of our life in Christ, then, then we're going to find it everywhere. And we're going to, it, the story is going to pick up momentum as we go through the different eras. And the eras, of course, will be the Edenic era, the Mosaic era, the Exodus, and then we will move to the person of Christ. And, and, and let's do this. We'll try to pause after each, each era, if you will, and, and consider, so what? what? What do we do with this? And, and Waven was suggesting that, obviously, feel free to, to submit questions. And I'm not, I'll, I'll probably be able to get to some, but not all of them. But, but even more, why don't you submit applications of this? If you're anything like myself, I, I went to school for many years, and, and, and I think I probably raised my hand in class three or four times in, in all the years I was in school. And I'm, I can't actually remember those three or four times. I'm just assuming that it might have happened. I am not, I'm not a real participant. I am a learner, but I don't tend to be a participant. And, and if you're like me and you don't tend to submit tons of questions, well, consider submitting applications. What, what do you do with this? How does this enlarge your understanding of Christ and in your particular calling. So off, off to Eden, or, or should, should I say, off to the original Holy of Holies. If we, if we look at Eden through the lens of, of the Hebrews, what we're going to find is that it, is, it truly is the original place where God walked, and wherever God walked, and you see in your outlines here, your PowerPoints, I say Jesus himself walked. And what I'm suggesting is that appearances of Jesus on earth uh, certainly are, are after his incarnation, but they also precede his incarnation. So, so Jesus walks among us, and wherever God walks among us, this is a holy place. This is a place where heaven and earth meet. The Leviticus 26 passage is, is, is just a passage that says God walked among them as he tabernacled with them in the, in the wilderness. This phrase, heaven and earth meeting, it, it, it's, it, I, I am really tickled by this. And, and let, let me sh let, let's pause on it just for a moment. There's a, there's a picture, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Some of you perhaps have seen it. Most of you have probably seen a picture of it. And Michelangelo, he, the, at the centerpiece of the picture is God and an Adam just about touching. You know, there, there's, this, there's just this dramatic space between their two fingers. And, and we, we understand why he drew it that way. But when we go to the original Holy of Holies, the, the fingers meet, the, the hands join, and, and heaven and earth meet in this walk that we have with, 
with Christ. This is the original holy of holies. There are different ways we can identify this. I'll just give you one. Out of, out of this holy of holies come rivers. Rivers flow from Eden and they, they water the garden. And when you, when you look at some of the later temples, later versions of the temples in scripture, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40 to 50, uh, Ezekiel's temple and the temple in Revelation, you have the exact same imagery that, that waters flow from this holy of holies and they spread out and bring life to the land and, and even to the world. So welcome to the beginning of scripture. We are people who are intended to live in the holy of holies. And and there, there, there are a number of signals in, in the Edenic story that, that suggest that God's glory, this holy of holies, is intended to encompass all of creation. But right now, it's, it's in, in a sense, the glory of God is temporarily sequestered. And, and so there's going to be a lot more that's going to happen. But this is a wonderful starting point. If indeed... That this is the, if, if this is the Holy of Holies, then, then who are we? We're priests who live at this junction. I, I think it was Calvin who, who used the expression of a tryst between heaven and earth, this, this romantic rendezvous, if you will, between heaven and earth. We are people who, who are at home in the heavenlies with Christ and are at home in creation where we live for Christ. And that's what priests do. They, they live at that, at that place where heaven and, and earth meet. We're called to keep the garden. And, 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 and here again, it's, it's a much more priestly task than you realize. It's not merely gardening. You, you keep the garden in good shape. The word keep is, is actually a word that appears, as you see, in Numbers chapter 18, where the priests are to keep and to guard the sanctuary. They're to protect its holiness. The, the next time after this, after this Genesis account, the next time we will see the word keep is when the cherubim is designated to stand at this holy of holies with this blazing sword to keep people at bay. He's guarding the, the sanctuary. Our, guard, our job was to, was to keep and to guard the sanctuary, which, which implies that the snake should have never been in there alive. He should have never, he was an intruder who should have never been allowed in, in the sanctuary. Here's, here's a quote that, that uh, comes from a book by Julie Canlis. You're going to find this at the, the end of your slides. It's called Calvin's Ladder, and it's essentially a quote by Calvin as well. Isn't this, it's, this is sweet, isn't it? The proper condition of God's people, of, of the proper condition of his creatures, of his humans, is to keep close to God. That's, that's our job. How can we be close to God? That's, that's how we were intended to live. Uh, quickly going on the story, you know how it goes. We, for some reason, we left our calling. It's, the word calling probably is, is not sufficient here. We left our priestly calling. It, it, we, when you have a calling, it's something you're just suited to. You are called to ministry. You're called to working with children, whatever it might be. It's just something that fits. You it just... It's like you're a whole person when you're doing this calling. We have left our calling. That, that being a priest, being at that place where heaven, where heaven and earth meet, it, it, knowing closeness to our God, that's what humanity was about. And, and for some reason that we will never fully understand, we, we turned our back on our priestly calling. And when we turned our back, back on our priestly calling, we left our life. Christ was our life. Life is, life is in association with him, and so death now falls on us. We, lost, we left our glory, our, our, our meaning, our satisfaction, our prestige, our, our status was all wrapped up in, in our connection to our God. And so shame enters the world as, as well. And what happens is we now move to the, the outer courts of the temple. 
and even beyond the temple. The, the picture seems to be, remember the, the, the cherubim who's guarding the Holy of Holies. There, there are different ways to think about that. One way we can think about the cherubim guarding the Holy of Holies is that, 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 that once they were out of the Holy of Holies, they began to get some sense of what they did and how there's no life apart from the Holies and they wanted to come back in. So here they are waiting to move back into the garden. And, and now everything has changed. To, to go back into a holy place where you are not holy would mean death. And so as a result, the cherubim is, is, is God's gracious way of, of protecting the, the courts. Before we stop and pause and consider what do we do with this, let me, let me add something that comes fairly quickly in Scripture. And, and you see, nothing has changed. God's purpose was that we would be in fellowship with him. We, we would be his priests who are comfortable in heaven and earth and in where they meet. And, and you find in Genesis 28, a, 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 it seems like a fleeting passage, but it's exquisite. It's just, it's just beautiful. Jacob is, is leaving his, his family. The promises were made to, to Abraham and to his progeny. He, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a perilous journey. He's going outside the motherland. He's going to, to find a wife. If, if he doesn't find a wife, it puts the promise in jeopardy. He goes down and he sleeps, and at night there's a ladder that appears in the dream. And angels are ascending and descending the ladder. God himself is at the top of the ladder. When Jacob wakes from this dream, he, the first thing he does is he builds something. And he says, this is the very house of God. Because there was heaven reaches down to earth. And the details of what that ladder is going to be about, are, is, they're, they're unclear at this point. But somehow, the ladder appears. And uh, it's, what do I do with that initially? I, I think that's great. But, but the older I get, the less I like ladders, to tell you the truth. They're, they're hard work. And, and, and I've fallen off a couple ladders. And one of my worst nightmares is, is, is I'm up, I find myself on top of a ladder a an infinitely high ladder and it's wobbly. It's starting to fall over and I had to quick run down the thing before I actually fall. So, so there are some perils in ladders and, and it seems like a long way to get from earth to heaven. Uh, but those details can be left for, for another time. At this point, God is still going to make us his priests who are suited to live with him. John chapter 1, verse 51. It might, you might be thinking about this one. This is Jesus when he appears to, when he, when he comes to Nathaniel. He's already told Nathaniel that he knew him when he was under the fig tree. Nathaniel is blown away by whatever Jesus was able to, to, to communicate to him at that point. And then he says, you think this was impressive? Well, you will see, you will see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And, and, and it's clearly invoking this original ladder picture. But now the, the picture is the Son of Man is at the bottom of the ladder. And the reality, what we're going to find, is we are not going to ascend the ladder by ourselves. We will never, we will, all, we will be going up the ladder, but we will have our God with us as, as we do. So no, no toppling before we get to the top. So this is just the first era in in, 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 in the priesthood, what, what do I do with that? What do you do with it? I, I can't, I'm not giving you all the details, I realize. But, but, but this is who we are. We were intended to live in fellowship and communion with our God in his house, in his very temple, enjoying his hospitality. And actually participating with him in, in, his, in the care of his house. That's, that's who we are. The problem is that the angel is now blocking the Holy of Holies because if we get in there, we're going to die. But, but the story, the story now, now moves on. And, and the Lord calls his people to himself. And he says... 
all of you are royal priests. Nothing new. It's duh, 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 something we don't know. This is the way it was in the garden, but it's, it, it's been, it's been reiterated. And, and, and oftentimes when there are questions that we might have about God's care for us and in who we are, he comes and he simply repeats his promises. And here he repeats it. You have been a priest in the garden and you will continue as a entire nation. You will be my priest. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be not just a tribe that has priests in it, but you will be to me an entire kingdom of priests. And, and, and not just having priests that are holy and set apart for me, but an entire nation that is set apart for me. So, so, so nothing has changed. We are still called to be these people who live at the confluence of, of heaven and, and earth, and God is going to do it. And it is for everybody. Here, here's just a little bit of evidence how it's for everybody. For example, the, the people were told to present a sacrifice, a lamb. And the blood of the lamb was placed on the, on the doorway of their homes as they were in Egypt. And, and they, they lived within that doorway. Anything that was in, within that doorway was given life because it was, they were royal priests doing their royal priestly thing. They were having communion with God. Where there's communion with God, there is life. And on the outside, there is, there is death. Oh, by the way, I should stop here. Uh, I, I, w- I went through this with my wife just, just yesterday. And, and, and I think it was at this point, she, you know, she asked, could you tell me what's going on? I'd, I'd like to hear what you're going to be doing. And she said, this would be great. I, I'll practice a little bit and go through these slides with you. And when I got to this slide, she fell sound asleep on me. Now, it was, it was a long day for her, granted, but, uh, but she still fell absolutely sound asleep. So no sleeping, no sleeping. Whether you're in Australia or Singapore, it doesn't matter. No sleeping quite yet because it's, it's, just, it's just too good. So stay with it. All of us are priests. All, everyone was called into this Holy of Holies, all of God's Israelite people. And in that Holy of Holies, what did they do? They, they had a meal. They ate the lamb together with the Lord. These were the priests. These were people who were being, they were saying nothing has changed. All like, like, like Adam, who was a priest before me and Eve, all of you will be priests before me. And, and, and not only do all of us in Israel at that time, join him in that day of atonement, join him in eating a meal, but we're all, which are sort of, sort of spatial places, we're also called to, to, in a sense, his temporal holy of holies, which is, which is the Sabbath, which is his day. And the Lord is saying, you are going to be special people. You are going to be brought in to my day and, and it will become your day. So, you, you, you see where we are. We're moving into the next part of the story right now. We're moving into the Exodus and, and the details of how the Lord is going, to, is going to restore this priestly task is that is the key story that, that we're going to be following. And, and, and now what he's going to do is he's going to move from this, this announcement that all of us are priests to the fact that there is going to be one tribe of priests. So all eyes on, on the Aaronic priesthood and, and the Levites. But everybody knows that, that we are with them. When they go into the tabernacle, the high priest wears this garment, this ephod, and all of us are represented on that ephod. So we ourselves are not able to draw near. We are not able to be at that place where heaven and earth meet. Not to mention the high priest can only do it occasionally. Everybody else is drawing near, but, but we share in what the high priest does. So we, not just the, the, the tribe of priests, but we are consecrated. We are, we are made holy, not because of anything we do, 
but because God himself is committed to his communion with his people, and he will set apart priests for himself. And, and so included in, in, in the priestly rituals are, are washing, bathing, and, and also being dressed. Exodus 28, you probably know this. It's just such, it's a great passage. It's these beautiful garments that the priests wear as they, as they are now dressed appropriately to, to draw near to him. Of course, how do we approach God? The, the priests, the Levitical, the Aaronic priests, they approach God through death and, and through fire. Death was happening all the time. Fire was happening all the time. And this is the way they, they, they were drawn near to the Lord. But, but again, let's, let's remember where the story goes. And, and we, too, approach our God through death, through the death of the final sacrifice, and also through fire. And the fire, it now it comes, it comes into focus much more clearly. The fire is the very spirit from, from God himself. This, I'll just give you one other point about this, this tribe of priests. And, and it's this, that, that holiness, obedience to Christ, is, is not an end in itself. It is a, it's a means to an end. I mean, let's see if I can illustrate that. I think marriage illustrations are the ones that that come most naturally here. I I am faithful to my wife. I I avoid conversations that, in in a sense, I'm obedient to my relationship with my wife. I avoid conversations that could somehow could somehow splinter it. I avoid pornography that could somehow splinter it. I I I, I I want to protect my relationship or guard this relationship in, in what I do and, and even the way that I think. The purpose is not that I'm so obedient. The purpose is that obedience serves this nearness in the relationship. It serves the purpose of communion and intimacy. So holiness is, is a means to an end. Holiness, be holy as I am holy, but it begs this question, well, why? Because, because as, as, as you are like me, it is our means of communion and fellowship together. A couple of comments on the priestly work. It's, it's going to set us up for, for our, our eventual work. What do priests do? They draw near to, to their God. They, they have that meal with their God. They, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's reaching toward heaven and reaching toward earth. As we reach toward heaven, we, we share that heavenly meal. As we reach toward earth, we, we bless. We'll get to Numbers chapter 6 and that priestly blessing, that, that wonderful priestly blessing. But the priests, they, they had the privilege of being able to pronounce these good words. Essentially, it says to put the name of God on people. And those good words were... were we're, we're coming out of this holy of holies where God himself lives, and they were this offer of life to, to the people who heard. That's who you are. You're a priest. You can bless. You're also called the garden, protect the sanctuary. It's, it, it, it's a holy place, and, and we, we care about other people too much, and we also care about the glory of God to, to allow sin to, to go on unattended in, in our own lives or the lives of those that we, that we love. We, we want to bear their burdens and, and when we want to do the battle against sin right along with them. Here's, here's one more. I'll just, there, there are a number of priestly tasks. I'll just give you one more. And Wayne, if you have any, anything that you want to insert here in case you're falling asleep, not that you're like my wife, I recognize, but, but here's just one more. I'm just throwing it out for fun. The, the priests were the ones who, who led the people out to war that, you know, they, they taught, they instructed, but, but when they were going out to battle, the priests assured them of God's promises and, and he assured them, of course, it should make, makes perfect sense of God's presence with them. The, the heavens will come and he is with you because you are his people. 
and there's a whole lot more to come. It's, we're just we're just getting started in this in, in this this priestly motif, and 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 of course there's more to come because we all have to be priests. That's that's the nature of this. And so far, it's it's relegated to a small group. So so we know there's more to happen. Wayne, any any questions that you want to ask or anything you want to do to to sort of drink your coffee now, or? Sure, absolutely, Ed. Thank you so much for the content so far. A couple of really great application questions. Um, first, a clarification, though. When you, who are you referring to exactly when you discuss the priesthood? Are these pastors, counselors, or is this all of us? Is this everyone who's online right now, or is is there something specific in the roles that we play? If if we have come to Christ and and said that Jesus is Lord, if we have come to Christ and and by the Spirit have been able to say Abba Father, then we are priests. We, you know, the reason I said we with Adam is because Adam's story is our own story. The reason I said we with this this Old Testament priesthood is is that we are in we are, we are embedded in Abraham, and 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 this is this is not the story of of a distant Hebrew people. This is this is our very story and will become even more personable, personal as time goes on. So this is, this is the story for, for absolutely all of us who, who follow Christ. Thank you. Briefly, can you tell us what this looks like then? I know we've got this slide up that's talking about the priestly work, so this is going to get to it, but what does this look like in the life of a local church? Can you give maybe a, an example or a, a brief case study of what it looks like to be a priest in a local church? Uh, together as a community. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Let me let me think of a couple things first. For a pastor, it means means all kinds of different things. It it means at least that when you give a benediction at the end, it is it, 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 it's this great privilege. It's anybody could give it because we're all priests. But 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 the pastor is typically the one designated to give it. And, and, and you know, we, we oftentimes raise our hands uh, with a priestly benediction. It's, it's hard to know exactly what the, what the intent of that is, but when people were moving their hands around before, they were laying it on goats and animals. And, 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 and is this the Lord himself who has laid hands on us as he has given us his benediction and we can offer it to others? So you give a benediction with great enthusiasm. Uh, what else does it mean? And, and, and I'll, I'll jump the gun on this. For me, it means that 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 fellowship and communion is is so central to the heart of God, and and a church service is a time when we draw near to the Lord, and 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 and, and the service should have that kind of feel to it. Come closer come closer and, and 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 then derivatively in our relationships with one another we we're recognizing we are we are people who who now can have communion and fellowship with one another there is that there is that unity that we can experience that kindredness that we share so it enhances the it's the most ordinary of conversations. I'll, I'll say a few more things about that in a little bit, but it's a great question. That's, that's what we have to be grappling with. What do we say? What do we think? How do we feel differently as a result of this? Can I go on, Wayne? Let me. Can I ask one more question? Sure. And then, yeah, and so there's a theme that's come up in a number of questions here that has to do with sin. This has not been crystal clear so far. I can't <laughs> believe that. No, this is great. This is great. <laughs> so sin, shame, unclean, these words are coming up in the questions. And one person uh, crystallized it as, what do you do when a priest sins? Which I think is a great, just a really great question. And you mentioned earlier that this priesthood topic really came out of your study of shame. So can you tie those themes together of we're priests, but we're unclean, and we sin, and we need grace. Can you, can you clarify some of that for us? Well, priests certainly sinned, and when priests sinned, they would, make, they would make sacrifices. That's, that's what they had to do. They're, 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 it, what, what is sin? It's that, it's that turning away. It's, it's leaving our priestly vocation. And, and God has determined that it's sacrifice, death, and fire, are going to be the way to to be able to move toward him. So there was there was there was always a, a way for the priests to return. 
and and the way they returned was was largely the way the the people returned through 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 the blood through the sacrifices through washing through cleansing thank you Ed. feel free to go on all right now it gets it gets better all eyes are now on the priest himself and in the picture is john 151 the priest has descended and in heaven has come to earth where where we were not we we were not able to meet at heaven and and so heaven comes to to earth uh, that's in John 151 and in the Luke 3 passage it's the spirit descending and and, and so you have this this trinitarian descent this the, the, the father speaking of his love for the son which is on, on our behalf because he's he's speaking love to all those who will be incorporated into the Son. Uh, so his words are coming down. The, the Son has already come down, and now the Spirit is coming down and resting on, on the Son. So there is this massive descent as, as heaven comes to earth. The, the priest descends. And, 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 and when this priest comes, the, the person of Christ, the, the job description it gets a little bit bigger than it once was. And here's just one place where it gets bigger. In Hebrews, and, and here certainly Hebrews is the main text for Christ as a priest and us as, as priests. It's the most explicit text for that. The Lord is not only a trustworthy priest, but he's a merciful priest. And, and, and in Scripture, you don't get a sense that the priests are that merciful. They're, they're separate from the people. They, they have to stay away from, from the riffraff. But here is the new priest who is descends. He gets himself, he goes through the hardest of things. He gets himself dirtied by the people around him. And, and in that, there's this mercy and compassion that he demonstrates. So compassion and mercy are now embedded in the priest who, who we follow. So the job description is, is enlarged. The, but it continues, but it's just more beautiful. The, the priests would pray on behalf of the people, pray for the people to the heavens. And, and in John's chapter 17, you see Jesus doing the same thing, that he, he is the one who joins heaven and earth in his very body. And, and he brings the requests of his people to, to his father. Also, you see him blessing in the Luke 24 passage. It's, it's the very last words of Jesus. And what it, he's raising his hands, and he offers this priestly benediction to the people as he, as he even is ascending. So the priest descends, and, and it turns out that, that the priest is, 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 is not simply a priest. He's also the tabernacle itself that in john chapter one jesus he came and he tabernacled among us we all know john's version of that it is fascinating insight that john brings that the holy of holies has now come down to us in the person of christ this, this sort of moving holy of holies and, and 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 now as we come close to him as as we touch heaven there's healing that takes place. Life is given to people who are dead. The, the living tabernacle has come. Matthew chapter 21, we're familiar with the cornerstone language of Scripture, where Jesus is the cornerstone. The, the intent behind that is it's the cornerstone of this new temple. The old temple, it's, 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 it's done its work. It, it's, it's run its course. And now for the new covenant, there's going to be a new temple. And Jesus is going to be the cornerstone. It begs the question, well, what's going to be the rest of it if Jesus, Jesus is going to be the cornerstone? And we know, we know how that story goes. But the priest draws near. When he draws near, he's, he's the priest, he's the tabernacle, and, and he is the, the sacrifice himself. Here again, John incorporates this into his very first chapter. Behold the Lamb of, of God. The, the entire temple structure is now descended to earth. And the one who has become like us, and in his sufferings, he is going to be the perfected priest. As we are joined with him by faith, he will become our perfecter in in our own priesthood. In his death, he, 
he ascends the ladder and and the spirit now descends to us so we can ascend along with us with along with him and this glory that once was sequestered is now busted loose it there there are no boundaries on 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 the tabernacle it's it's sent out into the world here's here, here's here are the things that we've been waiting for really what do we do with this yeah you know, it's, it's this it's this wonderful story i'm just giving you a few pieces of it it's, it's this wonderful story that now how do we live how do we how do we think because of these things here's what the apostle paul identifies if we have if we have named the name of Christ, if if we have said to Jesus, "I need you," if we have said, if we have if we have said that Christ is is Lord and, and Savior, that's the evidence that we have been brought in to Jesus, and and everything that was His is now our own, and we have been perfected, washed, not just on the outside, but but the the inside as well. There's a huge theology of that. Uh, I'll leave that for another time. Who are we? We're people who have this familial communion. We're not we're not perfect. We have been perfected because of our we we're brought into Christ, but we're not we're, we're, we're not sinless. When I think of an illustration of that, uh, excuse me for bringing in my grandchildren, but some of you probably expected it. One of the grand times we have as a family is when we're all together. We we open up our table as big as it can be, and we have these old glasses that we that we did a toast with for the for our daughter's weddings. We bought them because they're they're really cheap, and and so everybody's given one of these these toasting glasses. All the grandchildren. The grandchildren go from eight to to two, eight to eight to six months, and. And we do toasts, and and the grandkids are so into it. Where the toasts are, I love Griffy and Gogo so much. Griffy and Gogo are our grandparent names. I love Griffy and Gogo so much. Cheers! And we all click our glasses and, and have a grand time. And and then oh, I love Griffy and Gogo even more than that. Cheers! And and then somebody says, I love Jesus, and I love Jesus so much. I love it. It's it's this family communion with children who at this point we know they're boogers. We know, we, we know that they're rascals. They were perfect. Uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm just teasing here in some ways. They, their, their rascalness didn't show up until they were one and a half. And then they came out big time. But so we know we're all sinners sitting around the table, but we have this, this, this luxury of, of this communion. And, and we hear together this God who keeps saying to us, draw near draw near the hebrews 10 passage is is the veil has been torn and the picture there is the the veil was this blue veil this picture of the cosmos and 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 move now from the earth to the heavens come back in to the holy of holies as as you were intended to be and and now be be those people who were intended to live at that juncture of both heaven and earth. The first Peter two passage is you come to him, the lively stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones. That's there it is. It's he was the cornerstone. And, and for some reason he's allowed us to participate in this splendor. So we're part of, we're these stones that, 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 that erect this Holy of Holies and, and even in our very lives, we can offer these spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. So here's, here's some of our job. Job number one, to enjoy his hospitality. That's if you're, if you're brought into communion and fellowship and you didn't do anything to deserve it, you just, you just plain enjoy that hospitality. <sighs> I'm thinking of a couple different things. I'm thinking of two friends who, who, who are going through deep struggles, but they know by faith that God has called them into his divine hospitality. And, and as a result, they feed on the word through the spirit until they, until they know something of joy, until they simply enjoy who God is and what he's done. Let me give you a, a slightly different version of it. Enjoy divine hospitality. When I go to a wedding, and we're sitting at our tables. 
when the bride and groom come to our table, it's, we are so honored. And, and, and frankly, even, even when I was paying for two weddings and I was technically the host, uh, when my daughters and their, and, their, and their new husbands came to our table, it was, ah, it was, it was this great privilege to simply enjoy the God who is, who, is, who is drawn near to us so we can draw near to him and enjoy his divine hospitality. Now, remember how I talked about how holiness is, is a means to an end. Uh, at CCF, we often talk about progressive sanctification as, as the way we grow. It's, it, it's not a light switch where all of a sudden we're become, we become perfect. We, we grow in, in our knowledge of God and in our obedience to him. Here's, here's another way to consider progressive sanctification. And, and this in quotes because it's not original to me. I, brought, I got this from uh, Michael Morales, a book that also will appear at the back of your slides. To enjoy and pursue progressive nearness. To, to recognize, you see how this, it, it, it takes us out of the realm of mechanical obedience and, and it gives us a certain delight. I want to fight with sin because, because it, 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 it gives the privilege of this progressive nearness. We, we have Christ, but, but there's also this near, progressive nearness. We have the Spirit, but there's also more of the Spirit that we can have. Those are, those are things that are hard to understand, but they're true all the same. And, and, and to, to fight against sin and to, and to love well, to, because, because love is a pleasure, but also it, it is a way of, of of, of establishing even further that communion that we have with our God through Christ. What do we do? We've been told to draw near. We've been told to come and be part of this tabernacle. So we invite others to come, to draw near, to, 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 to know Christ and to put him on as they put him on, to walk through that split veil and enter in and, and now to participate in this building, this, this, edi- this new holy of holies called the church, that where heaven and earth meet, that royal tryst between our God and ourselves. And, and, and from this holy of holies to, to move out into the world, to pray, to intercede. Certainly one of the, the things that this has done in my own life is that his Given, given in a sense more oomph to the way I pray, where I, I have this privilege of being able to be comfortable in both earth and heaven and bring the needs of earth to heaven itself. This is, this is my calling. This is what I'm suitable for as, as, as are you. So we can pray and intercede with, with passion and, and with delight with, with others. What else do we do? We bless. Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you, be gracious to you. May he turn his face to you and give you peace. To, perhaps today you'll find an opportunity to speak words of blessing to others. Other things, perhaps you will, as you go to war, you'll help other people fight. You'll remind them in the midst of their addictions that, 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 that they themselves can know the very presence of God. They were built for communion, and, and addictions isolates them. And, and we all want something better than that. And so we're going to fight not only against a bottle, not only against the drug, but against Satan himself, who, who can lie about the source of life. Who are we? We're people, 1 Corinthians 7, we're people who, who, who essentially are these walking, portable tabernacles. And, and, and we want to travel around and, and, and bring holiness where we go. That's, that's who we are. It, 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 it's, this might sound silly, but sometimes in the United States, we put a little fish on the back of our cars. I don't do that myself, but one time I had a car that had a fish. It, was, it sort of shows that you're connected to Jesus. I always drove more carefully when I would, was driving that car because, because I, was, I was representing Jesus. Could you imagine, here's who you are. You're this walking tabernacle, and there's a walking tabernacle. Now head on out into the world, but, but you're, the whole, you're this holy of holies where the Spirit of God is with you, and, 
you're just a little bit more careful in the way you use your tongue, in the way you, in the way you love others, in, in the way you respond rather, in, 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 with patience rather than anger. So we're people who are tabernacles in the sense that make house calls. The, the other version of that is in John chapter 7, where the, the picture is of, of, of Ezekiel's tabernacle and the Edenic tabernacle and the final tabernacle, where, where as, as, we, as we drink the living waters, the, the Spirit himself flows outside of, of this tabernacle, Ezekiel 47, essentially, and it leaks out of us, and, and it brings life to those around us. That's how we want to live. That's people who, who, who are building this holy of holies. The, the church wants to, wants to be this leaky tabernacle where the spirit of the living God comes, overflows our banks, and, and moves into the very world to be able to bless it. And on and on and on. Wayne, what, what are you thinking? Thanks, Ed. Well, we have about five minutes to the end of our session. So here's what I'm thinking. Why don't I read a couple of the applications that have come in? Mm-hmm. I'll ask you one or two questions and then we'll wrap up. But for those who want to stay on after four o'clock Eastern, we're going to answer a few more questions for those who need to to sign off, that's fine too. So let me read a couple applications, ask a couple questions, wrap up, and then we'll stay on for a little bit longer. Uh, here's, here's an application that came through that you asked for. I'm reminded of when my children were small and could be comforted simply by my hand touching and holding theirs or by their ability to touch me. A related question that, that, that came in that connects to that is, what does being a priest look like for a stay-at-home mom? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Uh, what am I thinking? I am thinking that, okay, there's the, the, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, is, 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 it, it, it is expressed most fully in the Church of Christ. But it, for so, uh, some amazing reason, it can be expressed in an individual person. And so, so what's the single mom praying? The single mom is praying that would you, would you, would you allow me to be a fruitful tabernacle today? <laughs> Would you, in my, in, in, my, in my weakness, and frankly, sometimes even in my despair, uh, my holiness is not because of me, it's because of, of, of what I've been called to be from the beginning of time. And, and would, would the waters flow out of me to these kids one time today? <laughs> would, would somehow your spirit through me minister to them? So that's, yeah, it's, single mom is, is a perfect picture for that. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Here's another one. I'm struck by the word hospitality. One application of our priesthood is welcoming, is being welcoming and showing hospitality, both in our churches and our homes. So how does the identity of a priest affect how we engage the world and live as ambassadors of Christ? So I'm taking the hospitality piece and saying, how do we engage the world with that, with that application? I'll just give one little, little mini piece of that, that, that when in, in the divine hospitality, it's, we, we oftentimes think of a meal. That's, that, that's the way it's often expressed in scripture. When, when I think of hospitality, I think of friends who have been to our house we to their house, we out for dinner, and, and there is this delight in hearing the things that are on their heart. It is just a plain delight. And, and that's, and, and what, what is hospitality? Hospitality is you, you're really interested in your guests. And, and, and how many times, how many, how many times do people ask you how you are? How many times do people really show some kind of interest in your life? It's, it, it's, when, when people do that to me, it's still startling. It, and, and, and I live in a Christian community. But when somebody really wants to know how I am, that kind of hospitality, it is, it is arresting. And it points me to Christ even, even today. So what would hospitality look like? It's, it's a genuine interest as, as, as the one who's the host, a genuine interest in, in those that you are hosting, those you've invited. Thank you, Ed. 
Okay, one last application and one last question. I'm a missionary in Austria. I often tell the women I mentor that we need to have our feet on earth and our eyes on heaven. I didn't realize until this description of a priest lives where heaven and earth meets that I was talking about our priesthood. <laughs> that's so great. Great, that's great. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. And here's the last question, Ed. To which personal struggles does the motif of priesthood most helpfully apply? That is, how, how have you used this identity in your counseling experience? Uh, that's great. I, let, me, let me just think personally first. Um, my, I think my own tendency is to, is to um, struggle with insecurities. To, to I always have this sense that it, it's uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just never enough. I I, I, I it, it's just it, it's a sort of a chronic theme in my own life. Um, here's here's one of the features of being a priest that has been so precious to me. I am finally persuaded that. The Lord says even to me, draw near, draw near. And it's not because you're so perfect. It's because, because you've been clothed. You've been drawn near because of Christ, not because you have had such a, 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 a righteous day. Draw near because of Christ. No, further, further in, through the curtain. And, 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 and for somebody who doesn't feel authorized to draw near, it's, it's just been a great gift. And, and, I, and I do believe that that probably influences my counseling. I don't know what words that I use. But for those, I, w- I would say certainly most of the people I speak with, they feel as though even if they're arrogant people <laughs> or ostensibly arrogant, there's no way they feel like they can, they can come near. And, and to be able to pray, Lord, as you have drawn near to us, teach us to draw near to you. Teach us to hear your invitation today. So, so I'm just giving you one little piece of it. I, I recognize, but it, it's that draw near. We could say the book of Hebrews is the draw near book. It's the priestly book, and and it's it, it's Christ has drawn near to us, and and now we can we can draw near to God. Thanks, Ed. Well, I want to respect the time of our viewers. So, as I said, let me close for those who need to leave, and then we'll stay on for a few more minutes, answer a couple more questions, pray, and then and then close the, the session for everyone else. So first of all, thank you again for joining us for this first of our workshops. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we would love to get your feedback. As I mentioned, a recording of this session will be available at ccef.org forward slash live later this week. In your inbox already, you should have that survey I mentioned, so please would you give us your feedback. Tell us how we can improve. And you'll also find free resources and a link in that email that includes today's slides. You'll also have the opportunity in that email to contribute financially to CCF if you feel so led. Some of you watching today are already contributing financially to CCF and we want to thank you. It's because of your gifts that we can multiply ministry and we we have this workshop possible today because of your gifts. So thank you for that. And then an invitation to all of you to come to next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, Alistair Groves, Five Ways to Improve Communication in Daily Ministry. So for those of you who need to sign off, thank you for joining us. And for those of you who can stay on for a few more minutes, please please feel free to stay. We have a few more questions. Is that okay with you, Ed? It's great. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Okay, here's maybe, here's a challenging one. What is the connection between male headship and the priesthood of all believers. How does priesthood equate to male headship? Who asked that question? I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I guess what I'm wondering, is it, is it an important question? Um, uh, I, what am I thinking? I... I am thinking that we are all royal priests. We are all royal priests, and and there is a prominence to to that particular identity, and and so it means that my relationship with my wife. It means that I am zealous to bless her when she feels devoid of life. I am zealous to bless her, but but it also means. I want her to bless me <laughs> and, 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 and I want her to, to function priestly, even with me. So, 
so there there is an interchangeableness with with, with male and female under this particular heading uh, and, and 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 so I what am I saying? I'm saying both of these themes are operative in scripture, uh, especially with married people. Uh, and and I, I don't want one to, to sacrifice the other, but but I, I, I do want to say that that the the priestly calling is 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 a prominent one for all believers, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male and, and female. That doesn't quite answer the question. It's 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 it, it's an it's a very engaging question. Um, uh, I I am I am thinking probably of 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 coming at it from a slightly different angle than than headship and and submission. Um, not not a not in in a way that that it, it sacrifices one or the other, but it's a it's a different and it's a very, very important angle. And you know, I'll just say one other thing. It's, it, it's, it's what assures us a fellowship with God and with each other. And, and certainly as we have fellowship with God, that, that, that our, our, our desire is to be able to share that, especially in our closest relationships and, and have fellowship and communion there. Thanks, Ed. Let me, let me ask one more question and then we'll wrap up. As a sinner myself, how do I become comfortable in this role where we stand in between a sinful and selfish people and a holy and righteous God? Uh, I've been long with thinking about this particular theme in scripture over, over the past number of years, over the past couple number of weeks, I've been thinking about the book of Galatians and and so your 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 question causes me to merge the two of them. And the book of Galatians is 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 saying here's what is most important that we that we are found in Christ. We are found and and and, and he identifies the faith versus the law. And the faith is this place of rest where God Himself has has done it. And 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 Paul is so committed to us understand not not minimizing obedience for a moment but but emphasizing the priorities of life that the priorities of life is god himself has done this through christ through christ we are we are we we are sons and priests before god and unto him and and with him and and if i understand galatians and this this material in the royal priest correctly. It's it's let's keep the order correct. Uh, so if we are feeling especially especially sinful, what are we doing? Uh, we we ask for help because because if it's if it's this persistent sin, we we want to grow in that progressive nearness, and where there's no shame in in asking for help. But we also recognize that that our holiness is is bestowed on us because of our union with Christ because we have now heaven and earth meet and we are part of that because Christ is the very union uh, of heaven and earth and wherever Jesus is we are so all eyes on Jesus that's that's our task given given what you're saying Ed thank you so much for speaking to us today do you have any closing thoughts and after that would you pray for us uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, uh, to round off the story, Revelation 22. Here's here's what happens: the the dwelling with God, dwelling of God, is now with men, and and the this heavenly tabernacle uh, is now come to earth, and and indeed the entire earth is filled with His glory. And we live as, as priests unto God, enjoying his hospitality and enjoying his communion. So what do I want to do? I, I want to appreciate this call to draw near. I want to see obedience as a means to an end, the end being fellowship. And I want to, I want to, I want to speak with my brothers and sisters of, of how the, this holy tabernacle 
will someday be thoroughly beautiful and complete. It will consist of all of God's people. It will come to earth, and, and the Lord himself will be at the very center of it. And, and there will be no tears, no, no isolation at that point. Let me pray. Father, I pray that, that it, here's, here's scripture. It, we begin as, as priests in the garden. We, we turn away, but, but nothing has changed with you. You are so committed to, for some reason, to our communion and fellowship with you, that, that we would, would, in a sense, just go up the ladder. We, we would ascend the mountain of our God. You are so committed to that. You will do it, and you have done it with Christ. And we say thank you, and, and, and now enlarge our vision to not only see this story, but to see the story that's ahead. In the name of Christ, amen. Ed, thank you so much, and thank you all again for joining us. This concludes our session, and we hope to see you again next time. God bless.